Um, so we're going to just go through Genesis 3, um, which is the account of, of the fall, and just kind of break it down because a, it's the word of God, so it always enlightens our minds and our hearts, but also it's so instructive for teaching us about sin and about ourselves and about our own hearts and to help us steel ourselves against the, the wiles of, of the evil one. So this is Genesis 3. It says, and Max, stop me if you want to make a comment or anything. Sure. We'll go through it. It says, now the snake was the most cunning of all the wild all animals. All right, stop right there. <laughs> Literally, I know it's funny, but there is more, most cunning or more, most subtle sometimes used. Yeah. Subtle. We mentioned earlier mm-hmm. how it's funny how sin creeps up. Yeah. I think it's one of the first things to keep in mind. Sin creeps up. Yeah. The That's, evil one is, he's incredibly more intelligent, like infinitely more intelligent than us because he's an angel. What's that, what's that Psalm verse? He, he lurks like a prowling lion, yeah. seeking someone to devour. Yeah, that's right. But the setting is a night setting. There's, yeah. there's, there's, you don't see, mm-hmm. but he's prowling, seeking for the right time. So yeah, that's Subtle. why. Subtle. That's why. By the way, Jesus is always like, "Be vigilant, like be watchful, because because <laughs> there is a creature in this universe who doesn't sleep, who doesn't he's eat, a stay woke, and just hates you and stay wants up. you to go to hell." He does. Yeah, exactly. He does not want you to go to hell. <laughs> that was a very serious point I was sorry, making there, I, and you were I, just like I, joking about it. it is. Anyways, though, now the snake was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He asked the woman, "Did God really say you shall not eat from any of the trees in the garden?" I know you have something. To I say have something that. to say. Ratzinger, in this book that you and I both re- both recently read, but also other authors, the Divine Project, by the way, it's called. It's it's a great book. He points out the fact that when this the Satan Satan is so sly, he's so subtle and cunning, like you said, he doesn't just come out and say, "You should disobey God." Yo, eat that tree, eat that tree fruit over there, yo. <laughs> That's not what he says because if it, if he were that explicit, we'd be able to detect him and reject him theoretically. Mm-hmm. At least Eve would have. Instead, he just asks a seemingly innocent question. Like, did God really say you can't eat of any? And he doesn't even ask. He knows what he's doing because God just told him not to eat from the one tree. Right. But he says, did God really say you can't eat from any of the trees in the garden? He's also asking a rhetorical question. Yeah. Did he really say that? Right. And And he's like, like, and he, what he's wanting Eve to do is to, um, focus too much on the restrictions that God is placing on her freedom, right? Mm. He's wondering, did God really tell you you couldn't do anything? Well, no, that's not what God told me. But he, but he just starts with that subtle question. Yeah. And a lot of times when we're, when we're experiencing temptation, when the evil one's trying to tempt us into sin, he uses similar tactics. Mm. Um, like, did God, did God really say it would be wrong to, I don't know, mm. like drink alcohol at all? Like, you know, something like yeah. that, you know, like, um, and sometimes it may not be the Bible specifically. This is the thing that's important. When we talk about faith here, we talk about faith in the lived reality that's not just the Bible saying, don't do this. It's also, so when we're talking about morality, we're also talking about maybe your parents yeah, have told you, yeah, that's don't right. do this. Maybe your grandmother, maybe a friend, hey, don't do this. Well, you know, my friend told me this, but I've seen my friend do this other thing. Right. And so my thing is not as bad or maybe equal to. And therefore, I don't really have to listen to him or her. Yeah. This kind of thing. So Satan sows the seeds of doubt, right? So did God really say this? And then the woman answered the snake, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, you shall not eat it or even touch it or else you will die. What's interesting is that when God earlier in, in scripture had given them the commandment not to eat, he didn't say anything about touching the tree. Hmm. But Eve has already started to fixate on this restriction that God has placed on her freedom. So now she's already saying, you know what? God did tell me not to eat of that tree. And he told me not even to touch it either, which he didn't. Mm. Right. So she's lying. She's a lie. Right. right, So she's already, um, as the devil is sowing seeds of doubt that the father loves her and has given her commandment for her own good. She's already started to think to herself, you know what? God is restricting my freedom. There's an attachment to perverse goods as a kid, right? right? You've seen this. Oh, well, this thing does seem quite interesting. Right. Yeah. Right. But the snake said to the woman, you certainly will not die. God knows well that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods who know good and evil. So here Satan launches his full frontal attack, right? He is the liar. Mm. This is what scripture calls him, the liar, the deceiver. 
And here he does say, you certainly will not die, right? So he doesn't begin with his explicit full frontal mm-hmm. attack. He begins by subtly sowing these seeds of doubt in our hearts that the Father loves us. He wants us to doubt that the Father loves us. He says, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. That's a great promise. That's right. I should say that lie, but exactly. that's, that's a promise he's quote unquote saying. Again, going to, which we'll see at the end of this narrative, is a great lie. It's not, in fact, being like God. Yeah, that we, he's, yeah. he's saying you don't need God, which is a lie. He's saying God doesn't love you, which is a lie. He's saying, he's saying if you reject God, if you throw off the commandments that he's placed on you, then you'll experience freedom. True. Then you'll experience divinity, right? Then you'll truly be alive. Yeah. Which, of course, is the greatest lie of all. He says, you certainly will not die. God knows well. Oh, yeah, I already read that part. So the woman, now the woman looked at the tree. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes, and the tree was desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. What a weak man. Right, so this is the great sin of Adam, Mm -hmm. is that he was called to protect his wife. He was placed in the garden to guard and to keep it scripture says to till and to keep it it's often translated in english but it's actually to guard it Mm -hmm. right so he was supposed to protect the garden and his wife to lay down his life if necessary to protect the garden and his wife but here he is just hanging out next to eve she enters into dialogue Mm -hmm. with the evil one herself and he doesn't say anything doesn't question the fruit doesn't question the you know eve's uh, you know achievement of this fruit he just passively sits there and takes it Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. I think that's probably sufficient. Sure. I want to point out that Eve saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and desirable for gaining wisdom, right? So she was attracted to something that in and of itself was good, right? So when we sin, we only ever do anything because it appears good to us. We only ever do anything because there is an element of goodness in anything that exists because God created everything good, right? Goodness here being equivalent to desirable. We desire to think goodness. So when I commit adultery, for example, I'm not doing that because I want to I want to hate my wife because I want to cause division within my marriage. I'm pursuing a good that I perceive, which is the pleasure of this, of this fornication with this woman who's not my wife, right? So our hearts are always ordered to goods, but when they're disordered to the wrong goods rather than to the highest good, mm. that's when we sin. So Eve was attracted to this fruit because it was in fact good. It was pleasing to the eyes. It was, it tasted good and it was good for gaining a certain sort of wisdom. And so she was drawn to that, but in being drawn to that, in turning herself towards this created good, rather than the uncreated good, who is God, her father, she turns away from the one who loves her and ends up demeaning her own dignity. Mm. And I think that last line that ultimately that's what sin is seeking to do. There's a great lie of Satan saying, you will be like God. You will know good from evil. But all the while, in the background, what Satan really wants to do is to destroy you. (laughs) Because you are actually like God. And Satan could never be like God. That's true. And so there's this like, oh, you'll be all right. Not only will, you know, you'll be like him. He told you this, but you will not die. I promise. Mm -hmm. And that's where sin and death enter the equation. And what immediately happens there? Na- so before this took place, Adam and Eve, they were naked and without shame. They were totally themselves. They were utterly free as children of God walking mm. in the garden in friendship with him and with each other. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden that they've sinned, that they've turned their back on their creator. Now fear enters in ah, to the equation for the first time. I didn't time. catch that this time around. Right. So now they're afraid. They're ashamed. They hide themselves yeah. behind clothing because now what happens when we sin is that our image of God becomes distorted. We no longer are able to image of ourselves and our image of ourselves becomes distorted, right? right? So we're no longer able to look at God as a loving father who only wants our good. Now we see him as this judge, as this person who's condemning us. And so we hide from him in fear and we feel ashamed. And that's exactly what Adam and Eve do. And then their relationships with each other is also damaged after this too. So now they look at each other and it goes on. The, The ultimate punishment, quote unquote, for sin that God gives to them is that at like, 
the woman will desire her husband and he will dominate her, right? So like lust and discord enter into the relationships between humanity, between one person and another. And all of this is a result of not trusting that God loves us. You remember uh, our Theology of the Body episode with Dr. Ignatic? Yeah. We talked about original unity, right? So yes, we were created yes. for community at first because we were again created in the image and likeness of God. But then when sin enters the equation, all of a sudden that unity, which is intentional and known and responsible for for creation is now damaged and now there's solitude we mm-hmm. see that wait 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 what happened oh let me put this thing on i where's my wife what what yeah where's my you know and um but i think what you're saying is right we see god as the one who is now trying to set us apart from everyone and everything rather rather than the one who's trying to bring us into his life and into our own identity and this is um this is the beautiful point that Ratzinger makes is that the irony of all this is that, you know, we say that the sin of Adam and Eve is that they wanted to become like God, mm-hmm. right? But actually, Ratzinger says the irony is that their desire to become like God was not sinful. They were actually created to become like God. They were created mm-hmm. to share in his uh-huh. life. But they, cr- they were created to become like God, not after the pattern of the Father who creates everything and determines everything for himself. They were created to become like God after the pattern of the Son. Huh. As children who receive everything that they are from the Father. Beautiful. That's the path for man to become divine. It's through becoming like a child, through becoming like a son, which is why that it's the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, who is the one who became incarnate to save us and to teach us how to reach union with God. It's only through becoming children unless you turn to become like a child and receive and trust in the heavenly father that you can receive the kingdom of heaven, that you become like God. Hmm. So that's, um, that's what we're giving up on when we sin. Yeah. We're trying to be like God, the father, instead of being like God, the son. 